ministries. We're back at home. It feels good to be home and back at the dining room table. There's something about the saints gathered around the table and meeting in our homes that's just precious to me. So I'm glad to be back home and um, glad to be in the word as always with all of you. So let's bow in word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for where you have us in every moment of our lives. We just take a second to just think where God has each of us in our lives. He carries us in the palm of his hand. He has given us his word as direction, as guidance, as encouragement for us to walk in obedience and to give us such a great hope of all that is to come. Particularly when this world is, is difficult and hard, we have this hope and it is built on a firm foundation. Lord, I pray as we get into your word that you would be the words of my mouth. This is a, a difficult passage for me and I want to be able to speak with clarity. So Father, I pray that you would bless me with that by giving me your words. I pray for those who are listening and those who are <clears throat> seated before me that they that you would give them a mind and ear a mind to understand and ears to hear and a heart that is soft to receive what you have. So by the power of your spirit lead and guide us into all truth and receive all the glory in your awesome and mighty name and all God's saints said Amen. amen. Thank you for a good amen. <laughs> All right. So last week when we were together, we began this um, series of, of chronological events, beginning with John saying, and I saw that was in chapter 19, verse 11. Then there's a series of seven and I saw or then I saw in verse 17 and 19. Then it, we're going to go on into chapter 20, verse 1. 20 verse 4, 20 verse 11, and 21 verse 1. John is going to continue through this series of events. And we recall that this is what theologians call the last of the last things. And the events of these last of these last things begin with the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. The one who is faithful and true, who judges and wages war in righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The one who bears a name written on him, which no one knows and no one has blasphemed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the one who has written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Okay, chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 19, after the second coming of Christ, uh, the Antichrist, uh, the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to wage war against Christ and against his righteousness. This is truly the insanity of sin, to think that you can wage a war against righteousness and win. And yet <clears throat> he does. <clears throat> And what we see is that the beast and the false prophet are seized immediately and in, and in an instant they are thrown into the lake of fire. And then verse 21 goes on to say, and the rest who, who, who um, put, their, put themselves in a position to fight against the Lord were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the battle of Armageddon is this battle between good and evil, God and Satan, and really God has no equal. God has no match. This isn't a battle between the two of them. This is God coming to defeat the power of Satan. All right, let's move on to chapter 20 and we're gonna start in verses one through three. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So here again, we come to our fourth 
and then I saw. And again, we see this, then I saw. It builds this chronology of, of events happening one right after another. And so why is this important? Because honest, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians kind of come to a, a dividing fork in the road in this passage. This chapter 20 verses 1 through 10 is a very divisive passage among uh, among Christians. And we're going to continue to follow the golden rule of interpretation that we have followed from the very beginning. This is from uh, D.L. Cooper. I really like his definition. When, plain, when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Right? The purpose of scripture is to, to reveal God to us. He's not a God of chaos. He's not a God of confusion. So again, when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. That's exactly what we're going to do here. So again, these words, then I saw, this connects these passages as one continuous thought, an event occurring one right after another. And so why, I'm, I'm going to really drill this home because this is important, because again, there are those who, who see this passage, chapter 20, as a recap of what happened in chapter 12. They don't see these events as chronological, but I think it's best to view these as chronological because that's what the text demands. And so we're going to just stick close to the text. All right. So then I saw, what did John see? An angel. I think this is really interesting. This is an unnamed angel. I love in Revelation how much angelic activity we get to see and we're, we're aware of. This tells me there's a great deal of angelic activity happening all the time, right? And it gives you sort of this sense of, of protection and God's armies that are fighting for us. We just really get to see it in Revelation. And I think it's really cool. So God sends this unnamed angel from heaven. Notice that, that he comes from heaven. That reminds us he's coming with the authority and the power of the father. The father sometimes delegates his power and authority, but it, it, it's with all of that, that weight and authority that comes from him. And he comes with this divine arrest warrant with a key to the abyss and a ch great chain. Notice too that it says a great chain. Now, if we go back to chapter nine, this key was given to Satan and he was allowed to open the, the he was given the key to the abyss where he was allowed to open the abyss release the fifth trumpet, which was the, the judgment of the locust to torment the earth. So this key clearly belongs to God, the father, and he can hand it out to whomever he chooses. The great chain implies that there is, this is a great enemy that this angel is set to arrest. And again, he comes with a divine arrest warrant. And so who is this great enemy? In these next verses, the great enemy is identified and described. The first description in verse two, it says that he laid hold of the dragon. We got this description of the enemy in chapter 12, where the dragon had seven heads and 10 horns and seven diadems where he was seeking to devour the male child. This enemy, when, when we talk of, of Satan as the dragon, he is vicious, he is he is violent, he is, he is murderous. You wanna get the picture in your mind of, of a monster. And then it says he is the serpent of old. This takes us back to Genesis, right? He is the, the deceiver of Eve, the deceiver of old from the very beginning. He is the father of deception, causing us to think something is, is real or that something is, is a lie, causing us to believe that which is untrue. And then it goes on to say that he is the devil. He is the false accuser. Remember it says back in Revelation 12, 10, that he accuses us before God day and night. But remember the opposite is true as well, that he accuses God to us. I think this can be particularly effective in terms of the kingdom of darkness when our experiences in life don't match what, what we know to be true in scripture. For instance, we think, well, if God is with us, nothing bad should happen to me, right? Well, no, that's not necessarily true. Or even times when, when things bad things are happening and we're not experiencing the peace of God, why is this? What's going on? And so the devil will accuse God to us and say, well, is God really with you? Did God really say that? This is his character. This is his, his nature. And then it says that he is Satan. 
This is the adversary. And I love this definition of the adversary. Anyone or anything standing in the way of the completion of God's will or opposing God's people, either collectively or individually. So he is certainly a great enemy. This is no one you want to talk to. This is no one you want to uh, try to do battle with. This is a great enemy. But notice, God doesn't even bother to come himself to make this arrest. He sends an unnamed angel. Why? Because if God was to come himself to arrest Satan, would that uh, be somewhat of a compliment to Satan, that God had to come himself? Nope, God sends his angels. Again, Satan is not his equal. God has no equal. And he lays hold of and arrests Satan. Now it goes on to say that he lays hold of him. He bound him. Verse 3 says he threw him into the abyss, shut it, and sealed over. Sealed it over. It's that that um, sealed over gives that same idea of when the tomb was sealed for Jesus. This is maximum security. Notice he is thrown into the abyss versus the false prophet and the Antichrist were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the place of eternal torment day and night. The abyss is sort of a, a holding tank for the, the worst of the worst. And there is the, the possibility, like we see here, that the key is opened and they can come in and they can come out. Now, we also saw at the end of verse 2, it says the thousand years. Now, this is where um, where uh, Christians are really going to start to get divided. But I want you to see that the, the thousand years is going to be repeated six times within the next seven verses. So he really reinforces that his sentence is for a thousand years in the abyss. And so what is the purpose of this maximum security uh, sentence that he has for a thousand years? It's so that his ministry of deception will be bound. He will not be able to deceive the nations. If we think about it for just a moment, what would life here on earth be like without the deception of Satan? It would be a very different place, right? So during this thousand years, we will find out what life will be like without the deception of Satan. This is the next thing I want you to notice at the end of verse 3. It says, after these things. These are three very important words. After what things? After the thousand years. This signifies the end of an age. Right now and through these thousand years, this is known as the redemptive age of God. This is the redemptive era. And so this signifies that at the end of this thousand years, that will be the end of the redemptive era. And then it says that he must be released for a short time. And the short time literally means in, in the Greek, it is micro. It is this very, very tiny amount of time. But it also says emphatically, he must be released. Why must he be released? Well, the text doesn't say, so I don't think that we can be dogmatic about why he must be released, except to know that this is part of God's perfect, eternal, redemptive plan, is that Satan would be released for a short amount of time. I love that Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord. Why? So why is this? because it's God's will, because it's God's plan. And I'm happy to happy and fine to just leave it right there. All right, let's circle back to these thousand years and the eschatology, which is just a fancy word for saying end times, the eschatology of the end times, because there's there's three main views of the, the, um, the millennial kingdom. And if you flip over your worksheet, you'll see on the back of it uh, a chart that kind of outlines these three different views. Some people will say there are four, um, and I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and the reason, the way that they get four is that they take the um, pre-millennial uh, um, and, and it's divided into a historic premillennialism and then a dispensational millennialism. We're not going to get too much into that because we're going to just try to understand these three main views of the um, of the millennial kingdom. Okay, so we have premillennialism, postmillennialism, and we have amillennialism. All right, so pretty simply put, premillennialism 
means that Christ returns pre or before the millennial kingdom, the thousand years. That's easy, right? Post-millennialists would believe that Christ returns after the millennialism, post, right? After. Amillennialism, um, amillennialists, this is um, held by m most Catholics, is that there are there is no millennium, no that's what the ah is, no millennium. Okay, so there, the the real division between these groups is on the um, the the timing of the return of Christ and the nature of the millennium. So if you notice on the left side of the chart, these are the issues in which they are primarily divided. All right, so let's start with the premillennialism. The premillennialists believe that the the binding of Satan will be in the future. That's where this chronology falls in. Is that this is part of the end of the last things, the last of the last things. Okay, um, and I see that in First Peter five eight that the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking one to devour. So. In my mind, that makes it very clear that Satan is not bound right now. Whereas our post-millennialists believe that um, that Satan is bound right now and that we can, um, is, I think it's popular among uh, charismatics to, to, to say things like, oh, I bind you in Jesus' name. I can, I, I'm binding Satan. Um, I think that that's something that, that it requires a, a divine arrest warrant as we see what a powerful enemy he actually is. And again, our amillennialists would say that Satan is bound right now. Where do they get that? How do they understand that? Again, um, look back at chapter 12. They see chapter 20 as a recap of chapter 12 where Satan was bound in heaven and then thrown onto the earth. Well, here we see pretty clearly, if we go back to chapter 20, verse 1, the angel came down from heaven. He came down from heaven to earth. These are things occurring on the earth. Okay, does that make sense? All right. The next way in which they are divided is in the first resurrection. A premillennialist is going to believe in the actual physical bodily uh, resurrection of the saints. Um, and uh, the, the reason for that too is, again, when scripture makes plain sense, seek no other sense. 42 times in the New Testament, the resurrection is mentioned. Every single one of those times, it is mentioned literally. So why here, would, when, when the context doesn't allow for it, why would it be considered a, a figurative, a, a spiritual resurrection? So our post-millennialists and an amillennialists believe that um, when you receive Christ, you have this spiritual resurrection, and that is the, the first resurrection. Okay, the thousand years. Premillennialists are going to believe that that is a, a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ upon the earth. And uh, and then our, um, well, we'll get into the post millennium, we'll get into that. But all the numbers thus far have been literal numbers. Here's the other thing that really seals this for me that this is a, a literal 1,000 year. All of the prophecies of the Christ were fulfilled literally. Why would this not be fulfilled literally? Again, like the context doesn't allow for this to be figurative. So um, a post-millennialist, they would believe that um, they're going to see the, the, the uh, thousand years as literal and figurative in that they believe that there will be this thousand year sort of golden age of the gospel in which most of the earth is Christianized. And it will be at that point, they believe that almost all men will be saved and they believe that it, at that point, then Christ will return. Okay, so there's a point at which it's that's happening now, uh, but also that it's, it's not quite complete. So this was a very popular view up until um, sort of at the, the late um, 1800s and the early 1900s, this was a popular view. And then it took a nosedive when the First World War and the Second World War hit as people were beginning to feel like we're coming into this golden age and people are going to receive the gospel. And then some of the most horrific war crimes that this planet has ever seen occurred and that really took a nosedive. All right, so where does this rule and reign take place? 
again, a pre-millennialist. We saw Christ return to earth in his physical bodily form, right? We're going to believe that the reign and rule of this thousand years is going to be on earth. Postmillennialists and amillennialists see this um, the the rule and reign of Christ in our hearts, and that's uh, and that He rules and reigns in heaven. And again, uh, this this last part, and this is what I think is so crucial, is that when we just see this uh, text as chronological, as 19 and 20, as happening in order, then premillennialism makes the most sense. Uh, but again, uh, post-millennialists and an amillennialists see this as a recap of chapter 12. Um, so I know that that gets kind of messy, but I think it's important for us to, to understand. Um, and I think, you know, if we lost you in any of that, I, I think this is a really good quote. This is from John Frame. It says, so far as I can see, every Bible passage about the return of Christ is written for a practical purpose not to help us develop a theory of history, but to motivate our obedience. Everything written about the return of Christ should motivate us to greater and deeper obedience to what his word says. So you have probably guessed I am definitely a, a pre-millennialist. That is, that is the view that I take on, on scripture. I hold to the literal translation of what the word says and the chronology that is followed here. So that is the lens through which I view it and that is the lens through which I, I see it as the literal physical rule and reign of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's go on to verses four through six. Then I saw, so there it is again, thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them and i saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of jesus and because of the word of god and those who had not worshiped the beast <clears throat> or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand and they came to life and reigned with christ for a thousand years and the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So again, if we just take the plain sense of scripture, it's this passage isn't difficult. We don't get lost in this. So this is what happens after the binding of Satan. Then the saints come to rule and reign with Christ. Here it is in verse, verse four. It says, then I saw thrones and they sat on them. Well, who is this? Who is the they? This is the Old Testament saints. This is our apostles. This is New Testament believers. This is any tribulation martyrs, all having died either a physical death or having been um, caught up in the clouds and raptured with Christ and have received a glorified body. So verse four also gives us a description of, of the saints and what they are doing. So they sit on thrones and they are part of, of judgment, which means that they interpret and they enforce God's law during this 1,000 year reign. So they sort of have this judicial and, and political role in the kingdom. Now at the end of verse four, it says they came to life. And I think that's really important because if we if we go back to amillennialism and postmillennialism, um, that it, it, it doesn't make sense because the dead have not yet come to life. And yet here they do come to life. Um, all right, so then they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. So who is the rest of the dead? These are the unbelievers throughout all of history. And this is known as the, the second resurrection that they come, um, that they come from, they, they are resurrected at the end of the thousand years okay the first resurrection is the um occurs at the beginning of the thousand years when the old testament saints and the um and anyone who, who perished during the uh tribulation are brought to life all right and then verse six says blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection those of us who are resurrected here at this point 
this is a blessed, this is a, a favored and set apart position for us in this redemptive time in history. And we will be known as priests of God and of Christ and we will reign with him forever. What does this mean? As priests of God, we have a special privilege and a special fellowship and intimacy and closeness with him during this thousand year reign. And so how do we respond to this? Like I said earlier, we respond to this as it should encourage our hearts to obedience that this is what is going to come. I love what Jude 17 through 25, how he encourages us here. It says, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, Here's the exhortation, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, save others by snatching them from the fire, to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by the corrupted flesh. Now listen to this doxology to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen? Amen, amen and amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you that your scripture makes clear sense and that we need to seek no other sense. Father, as we digest your word, I pray that it would be profitable and fruitful, not only for ourselves, but for your kingdom, that we would be called to greater obedience, but we would also be called to love those who have not yet fallen in step with you, who have not yet been called to your obedience, Father. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for this time to be together in your word. In Christ's name, amen. amen.